Hello and welcome to the Women's Wellness Podcast. My name is Amy and I am the host of the Women's Wellness Podcast where the goal is to empower women to make informed choices and decisions about their health, life and family. And I do that by interviewing experts in the field of health, wellness, fitness, lifestyle and everything in between. Today, I'm excited to be interviewing Eugenia from Mind Foodness. Eugenia is the founder of Mind Foodness, which is an eating psychology clinic and body love yoga studio. She is an eating psychology coach with a Bachelor of Science in Business Psychology. She's also a mindfulness and holistic nutrition coach, motivational speaker and yoga instructor. She helps people to get their control back around food, whether they are struggling with binge eating, emotional eating, finding it hard to lose weight, or feeling overwhelmed by an eating disorder. Eugenia identifies the underlying cause and applies tools to rewire the brain for permanent change, which is great. Mind Foodness, as I've mentioned earlier, is an eating psychology clinic where they combine psychology, neuroscience, and nutrition to help people gain freedom from body, food, and eating issues. If you're not excited by that, I don't know what will do it for you, but I would like to welcome Eugenia to tell you more. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real <laughs> pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so excited that you're here because overeating just seems to be a global issue. And I'd love to hear more about how you got involved with helping people with overeating issues and how you got into the psychology of overeating and essentially how mind foodness began can you tell me more mm, absolutely it would be a pleasure well <clears throat> my own story is that i if i look back into my even my childhood i remember myself i was probably four or five years old and i would put all my toys on my um, titties and dolls out there in front of me and i remember passionately teaching them back then it was math don't ask me why i'm still good at numbers but <laughs> i don't focus on numbers so much these days but back then it was mathematics and i remember passionately telling them it's so important that you know this and then <laughs> I was, it was incredibly passionate and loud child but i was also a child I guess like a little bit that annoying child that asks a lot of but why questions <laughs> and um, I so it seems like even when I look back I loved helping people back then it was my toys because that was the listeners that I had <laughs> and um, so I loved helping but I also was always this curious child and wanted to understand why we do what we do and I really ask a lot of questions uh, and my parents sometimes got really in, impatient with me <laughs> um, so I remember those days so I think everything that I do it's ingrained I don't think that I chose it as such it chose me it, it really I was born with it um, and then also when I was growing up from the age of 15, 16, I um, then developed an eating disorder where because I always felt very different. I really felt like I never belonged to the people around me. I was not a lonely child or teenager. I always had friends and I always wanted to be part of it i wanted to belong i wanted to be accepted i was accepted but what i knew is that i wasn't myself i wasn't i always tried to even like make jokes as other people did i was watching tv shows just to be able to speak about it at school not because i was interested in them um i was talking about topics that 
other students or, or let's say my friends wanted to talk about not something that I was interested in. And then my, there was a little part of my brain, this little brain that somehow I don't, I can't tell you how because it happened all um, subconsciously or not on a conscious level. I developed this belief that I need to, if I lose weight or if I am thin, if I change my body, I will be liked. I will be, I will belong. And what happened is um, when I kind of started going on these diets, I lost weight. Now, I was always a normal child. I never had weight issues whatsoever. So there was even no reason to actually even lose weight. Um, but that's kind of what happened. And then, but when I did lose even more weight uh, and people started noticing, so girls started noticing it, I started get, started getting a lot of inquiries. So, oh, there you've got a thigh gap. So, how did you do that? What is it that you do? What do you? How do you eat? So, I started getting those questions. Now, I had this interest in me, right? There was people. So, these girls started noticing me, and there was almost like there was this external validation. Now I'm part of it. Now I'm, I belong. Now I'm part of this group. Now I'm interesting. So that's how my subconsciousness started believing if I change my body, I will be loved. Mm. I will be part of this group. I will be accepted. That's how it started. And it turned into an eating disorder that lasted over 10 years up until... Mm end of my twenties. Um, so that was kind of all part of it. Now, while all this was happening, I, I did different things. I became an accountant, realized I said numbers, right? <laughs> um, I became an accountant and then realized, no, I really want to help people. Um, so I decided to go and study psychology and chose uh, a degree in business psychology, again, numbers and mm -hmm. psychology, um, and had a double major then in coaching and human psychology and personnel development. And after my graduation, I um, went into HR, but again, wasn't happy, didn't like I was helping people, but not in a way that was meaningful to me. So then there was a day when I was in the midst of my eating disorder, hated my job, was absolutely unhappy doing what I was doing. And I thought, right, I really want to help other women who are struggling with what I've been going through myself. By that time, I already was in, um, so I was getting support and help. Um, it was my eating disorder and yeah so there was a day when I quit my job and said I'm going to be helping other women and uh, but back then I was focusing mainly on because I also already started new uh, studied nutrition so holistic nutrition uh, because I thought if I know what to eat then I'll be able to help myself and others so at the beginning, I was helping people more with nutrition, the what to eat, right? But then the more I knew about nutrition, the more confused I was. And the more difficult it was for me then to decide, what am I going to eat? There are so many diets. There are so many theories. I don't even know what is good for me anymore. Um, and as I was helping people, I realized people in general know what is good. They know what is healthy. They know that we should be eating wholesome food, right? More vegetables, whole grain, whole grains, all of that. But the question was always for me, again, this, the why child, why are we not doing what we know we have to do? Why are we not eating in a way we know is good for us? So that's when I get the got the switch and thought, right, this is what I actually want to focus on because I believe that is the core reason. This is the really looking into underlying reasons. Why are we not eating what we know we should be eating? How are we eating? 
mindlessly overeating, binge eating, right? Um, under eating, overeating, so everyone's spectrum. I'm still, still looking into what we eat. I still help clients with that, but mainly most people need to it's more like the, the, the why, the how, so the psychology. And that's how mindfulness came about. The name is kind of a different story in terms of why I chose mindfulness. But I felt like it was a good fit because, again, I'm focusing on the mind because I believe if we're focusing on the mind, if we can rewire our brain and reprogram how we respond to food, then uh, we can change everything else as well because a lot of it is habits and learned behavior. Um, and that's how, yeah, mindfulness came about. And that's how I started focusing on the things that I'm focusing on. Excellent. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Just understanding the backstory really helps. I think it helps people to relate to you mm-hmm. as well. They know that, oh, Eugenia has been through similar things to me. She understands, she knows, and she can help better than just Joe blogs who people don't know. Um, now we could branch off in a few different ways so you mentioned um getting in touch with your body over just knowing what to eat because people do they understand the gist of things how would you um go about helping people to get in touch with their body and their their hunger cues and things like that so they don't go straight and eat a whole bar of chocolates they can survive on one or they can they know when to stop when they're full things like that Mm -hmm. so well it it depends so um some people who let's say have been on diets or even have an eating disorder um history so which is both which is under eating so things like anorexia and orthorexia um or on the other side of the spectrum which is overeating and binge eating when we don't listen to our hunger and satiety cues after a while our brain stops signaling it. so we actually then don't really know some people really tell me i don't even know what hunger feels like I don't wow. even know when I'm hungry. I haven't been hungry for a lot of years. Some people don't know when they are full. They don't feel the fullness, so they can eat for a very, very long time or a lot, really large amount of food. So for those people, it's slightly different. Yeah. Now, for those people who don't know what is when they're hungry, when they're full, um, then I give them um, more like a framework. Okay, for that person, they need rules at the beginning, um, and I'm not saying rules because again, it's like it's going from one rule to another, right? That we don't want that. I do encourage them to learn to listen to that hunger and satiety cue, but to have a hunger scale can be great. So it's my more like a um, like a mental hunger scale, right? So if on, let's say on the scale, before I make a decision to eat, I say, okay, on the hunger scale from zero where you're really, really starving to 10 where you're really, really full, where do you feel like you're at? So we slowly teaching the brain to connect with our gut again mm. and practicing that connection again. And that actually helps. For some people, I do give them guidelines how to use their hand as a portion size. So we say, okay, this is your plate. Try to eat off that plate when you're at home, always from that plate. So you kind of know you can eyeball how much you need to eat. And then use your hand in terms of like, you know, the protein. We know it's a handful. Then vegetables is about a fist. Um, then carbohydrates, it's again a handful, and then fats is about sort of a, a thumb. So that's your one portion. So that's kind of, that's what I find 
helps people as well. So we don't um, weigh food. We don't talk about calories. It's more guidelines. Mm. But then again, there are days when you were physically more active, so you will need more food. Yeah. yeah. And then there are days where we're less active, so you will naturally want to have less food. Um, so I encourage them to practice that. And again, usually it helps just by slowing down, using that mental hunger scale, using the, um, the portion sizes framework, and then slowly, slowly they, they do get back to, to, to know when they're hungry and when they're full. And also, I guess, encouraging people, okay, this is your portion, even though it feels like it might be not enough know that you can go back and get more yeah give this a go wait for 20 minutes and then see if you still really want something just remember you can get more at any time it's there and and that helps as well to have that ease i know i can have more if i need to yeah i have one quick question before i go on to something related to that when you mentioned um carbohydrates in a cupped hand is that if you're having rice is that cooked or raw cooked cooked yeah cool yeah if you had that much <laughs> raw it would expand i just thought i'd clarify that for anyone listening if yeah. they go oh and grab a handful of rice and yeah. then try and eat all That's of it it's yeah it's a good question yeah um but moving on to what you just said is a lot of overeating linked to restriction and self deprivation? If people believe that they can't have something, is it more inclined to make them want more? Yes. So I personally, in the years that where I've been working in this area, binge eating and overeating, I have identified between six and seven triggers mm-hmm. and uh, deprivation and food rules, not eating enough. That is one of the triggers. And when I look into research um, that has been done, that shows that um, not eating enough, so dieting, restricting food is number one reason for binge eating and overeating. Second reason for binge eating and overeating is not liking our own body image and therefore going on a diet so again we are back then to restricting and yeah. or, uh, restriction and dieting yeah oh i'd love to know more about the other triggers so how what sort of triggers can we look out for so um as i said i have uh, so far identified about six to seven triggers and there is a reason why there's the seventh the seventh is kind of connected with another one that's right. why yeah. yeah so one of the triggers what i have found is i call them the sensory triggers so let's say think about the example you are walking on a street you're mm-hmm. walking and not even thinking about food and are happy and then you walk past kfc yeah yeah or chip and chip fish and chip shop yeah instantly mouse watering that's right right because you can smell it mm-hmm. so that's one of the senses you can smell food and a lot of the time think, oh my god we talked earlier about bread before we started recording yes. this right <laughs> we were talking about bread or the same we come home and it's a smell of fresh bread or someone bakes cookies you were not thinking mm-hmm. about cookies or bread or kfc before you started smelling yeah now your water your mouth is watering and you think oh my god this is just so delicious i'm gonna eat it yep yeah that was one of the sensory triggers Mm -hmm. it can also be we are watching tv in the evening they know how it works so what do they do there are ads for mcdonald's and pizza and ice cream and whatever else is there so we see food Right. And then we get this idea. When I personally struggled with binge eating, Pinterest was one of the biggest triggers for me because there was a lot of yeah. pictures, food pictures. Yeah. So, and then I had this, I guess, trigger of, oh, I could eat something. 
and then you're looking in the cupboards and trying to find something to satisfy. That's right. Yeah. So senses could be you see food, you smell food, you taste food. So you uh, try a piece of chocolate and then can't stop because now you've already tried it, right? It tasted it. Or even sometimes it's enough that you just hear people talking about food and think, oh yeah, that sounds good. Oh, I could have something as well. <laughs> yeah. So that's the sensory triggers. Um, number two is emotional. Emotions are, that is a big one. That's a heavy one as well. Um, because, you know, when we feel anxious, frustrated and particular right now right we have these times where a lot of us feel overwhelmed or anxious about the unknown we don't know what's going to happen um we are frustrated so a lot of people go to food to comfort themselves to soothe themselves right we learned mm -hmm. from very early on to soothe ourselves with food when we were little our mom was, would hold us, right? Give a bottle or a breast. And then, um, yeah, slowly we would fall asleep. So we learn to connect food to soothing, mm. to, to comfort. And obviously then also it releases dopamine in our brain. So, of course, it's a reward system. So we feel good. Yeah, we feel comfort. We feel happy. So, um, yeah, that's why that connects with the other trigger, which I call emotional attachment. So we connect food with also certain memories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we want food, not because we want that food, but because we remember the feeling that we had when we had that food. Think about grandmother's cookies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm just thinking back to every romantic comedy I've ever seen where there's been a breakup and the woman sat on the couch with a tub of ice cream just eating her feelings. And I never thought about it until it came up. And I'm like, yeah, I could do with some ice cream right now. I don't really eat ice cream. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that is learned as well. Yeah, mm. so because we probably would have never thought about it, but then because we've seen that so many times now, luckily, hopefully, we don't go through breakup very often. Yeah. But if it does happen, then I guess from my personal experience, okay, not that long ago I went through a breakup, and before that I hadn't, I didn't, I didn't experience breakup. I didn't even know how to cope with breakup. Yeah. So I remember I asked really my friends, "What do I do? How do I <laughs> work with it?" And I remember some some of my friends said, "Just get like ice cream and wine and chocolate and just kind of indulge into it." And I thought. No, yeah. <laughs> that's not how I want to do it. <laughs> but that's learned, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely um, emotional. So emotions, yeah, not being able to manage our emotions. Or we have learned when we are emotional, that's what we do. That When we feel certain emotions, that that's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about uh, trigger number three, which is dieting and rules, right, and restriction. Yep. Then another one is um, habits. It's mm. often a habit as well. So think about it. Um, you go to the movies. And a lot of the time people don't even question it or think about it. They just Buy go and get popcorn. That's right. Popcorn, ice cream, lollies, whatever else they get. That's one connects with the other. So mm. movies becomes a trigger for that food. And they're always the giant bags of Maltesers. It's either a giant bag or a little tiny bag, and that's not going to last very long. So people always go for the big one. And then with the, the good intention of sharing it, but it never happens. <laughs> and then you go, why did I eat all of these? Because you just mindlessly, yeah. No, that's it's... right yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah or some people when they when they watch movie like uh, even at home right or when they watch tv mm. in the evening food is part of it yeah so that's a trigger right that's a habit that's a routine that's what we do 
mm. without even asking ourselves, am I actually hungry? Do I want that? Yeah. Yeah. This is very eye opening. I'm looking forward to the others. <laughs> so um, the other one is sugar fluctuation, blood sugar fluctuation. Right. Um, if let's say we let's say start our day yeah, with cereal, that which has a lot of sugar in there, and then maybe sweet yogurt, and then maybe some fruit because you know it's healthy. But by the time we have this breakfast, we sometimes end up up to twelve teaspoons of sugar just for breakfast oh my gosh yeah. yeah because they say for cereal a serving size now the serving size is half a cup mm -hmm. nobody eats half a cup of cereal <laughs> no they fill the bowl that's right yeah. and then on top of it there is a bit of milk and then there is yogurt and then there is fruit um so that's how we easily end up with 12 teaspoons of sugar in the morning. That's so the blood sugar for the day's over. Yeah. Yeah. Because they suggest we should not have more than six teaspoons a day. That's the recommendation. <laughs> yeah. So just imagine now you've had this for breakfast, your blood sugar is high. About an hour, 45 minutes to an hour later, your blood sugar drops. When it drops, it feels very uncomfortable for our body, for our brain. It will then trigger, go and eat fast. Now, sugary, carbs, something mm -hmm. quick. <laughs> right? So we actually, some people will notice they're shaking. They feel very uneasy, uncomfortable, but don't link to why is it actually happening. Yeah. Yeah, so now they will crave a muffin, processed, something processed, carbs, sugar. Um, so they go and get like a muffin in the morning or a scone. Um, again, blood sugar spikes and then it drops and then we crave something sweet. And then in the afternoon, your blood sugar has now been going up and down, up and down. Now you're tired and exhausted. So what do you do? You get like a muesli bar because you know again it's healthy, but a lot of them has have actually up to two to tea to four teaspoons of sugar. Oh my god! This is so, insane. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So now it's night time. You come home. Yeah, so now you know it's night time. You come home and you have pasta, or you have baked beans on toast with some eggs and. Um, some of the cans of baked beans per can have also up to six to seven teaspoons of sugar. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's blood sugar fluctuation. Right yeah. There. Yeah. And that's without even going down the, the diet food, low fat. That's right, because they have even more sugar. They so have even more sugar in. Holy moly. Hey, what? Whoever's listening to this, I hope you're writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these are the six, um, I said seven. Uh, more like a general one, I find that even like things like certain beliefs and stories they can be a trigger and the reason why so let's so a certain belief that i hear a lot of the time i can't find a partner as long as i have this body shape mm. i can't go and enjoy my life as until i lost weight so there are those beliefs, the limiting beliefs, what we can do, what we deserve, what we can experience until something happens. Yeah. Now, that usually leads to us feeling very unhappy, isolated, living a life which does not feel meaningful. Yeah, we are disconnected from ourselves, from society, from meaning and purpose. Now, what do we do? We go and seek comfort and food. 
we see connection with food because food doesn't it's a cycle isn't it us. yeah yeah so i find that that is also a trigger i have not seen uh some of the things that i mentioned today in any of the books but to me that makes sense because that's what i see on a daily basis when i work with people yeah yeah. So, but all these triggers, um, that's going to be in, and I know that you're going to share the link in the workbook, the six hidden reasons for overeating and binge eating. So for those who are listening and it's like, oh my God, this is like so much information. It's all in the workbook. And in addition to the actual triggers, I also give suggestions what someone can do about it. So what is the next step? Once I know what the triggers are, what is the next step that that someone can take to improve their relationship with food. Yes, I will be sharing that link in the show notes because that is going to be such a valuable tool because just for me, and I am in the fitness and health industry, hearing somebody else list off the triggers is overwhelming for me to hear. So any normal person will, yeah, where do you start? So that will be very, very handy. And That's you've got a um, seminar coming up as well, an online seminar. Is, do you cover this in that as well? Yes, I do. Yeah. So the online um, seminar or online salmon solve the overeating puzzle, we are going to be diving much, much deeper into these triggers. And also then I will teach tools that someone can apply immediately. So these are tools that will help the person to reprogram their mind so they can reshape their relationship with food and also really can address the, those re core reasons so we need to know what are my triggers it can be just one or two it can be mm -hmm. all of them but some people or a lot of us a lot of people they don't know kind of what is causing it so they try different things i'm just oh i had a neighbor she or he they did well on keto i had a neighbor who did well on isogenics or on intermittent fasting so we try all these different random things but they don't address our issue mm. they don't cover what is causing overeating or binge eating or under eating or a relationship with food for us so that's why we will be going through those triggers a person will know exactly what are their triggers and what exactly they can do to then change the wiring in, the, in their brain and also apply tools to help them with let's say emotional eating or the overeating triggers so how to eliminate the urges even to want to overeat or binge yes and they can book that through your website as well is that right Yes, so it's um, yeah. mindfulness uh, dot nz and then slash events. Yeah, perfect. That's easy enough, and I'll share that as well. Um, before I ask about how people book in to see you, I'm just thinking about the last trigger that you mentioned and people's beliefs and perceptions. If you've gone through some coaching with them you've given them tips and they feel like they're going to do well and then they they drop off they fall off the wagon they have a, a binging session or overeating session how do you look after those clients or what tools do you give them to be more kind to themselves when, when that happens because it always happens we're yeah. not gonna we're not gonna change instantly in a heartbeat so yeah what ways can we forgive ourselves reset and move on rather than feeling guilty and creating that cycle again mm -hmm. so when i work with clients i always encourage them to have a book so where they write down tools that we cover right so even like today or let's say at the seminar i will be covering tools and there's not a lot of free resources that i teach and um to to help with with these triggers and my suggestion is write it down so you have something to go to you've got a workbook you know you okay um these are the tools that I can apply. And my suggestion is always to try as much as possible to take the emotions out of it, mm. but rather be curious. 
just be curious and like I say, put the investigator on, yeah, a hat on. Right. Be that investigator. Just have a look. Okay, that happened. What was the reason? Mm. What triggered it? What can I do differently next time? What do I want my outcome to be next time? So we want to be very clear on what is currently happening, like what has happened, what, what was the trigger, but also we want to know what is my ideal outcome. If I don't know the outcome, I can't really get there, right? So it's, yes. we call that the gap exercise. Yeah, where am I right now? Where do I want to be? What do I need to do to close the gap? Mm. So, and that's why we want to be very pragmatic and practical here. Yes. This is what happened. This was the trigger. What do I want my ideal outcome to be? And what is it that I'm going to do next time? Yes. And then it's a matter of practice. Yes. Yeah. Repetition is the mother of skill, as Tony Robbins is saying. <laughs> <laughs> so we just need to repeat the same tools or similar tools if that doesn't work try something else try something else then try again something else so but be very specific again about what is your ideal outcome and just keep practicing because if we talk about reprogramming our brain rewiring the brain it requires repetition we reprogram our brain through our thoughts and through behaviors now if we've been doing something for a very long time that is now a habit now our brain is wired that way there's a trigger so if there's a trigger there is um, a synapses are firing right so it leads to a certain behavior now we want to learn a new behavior and of course, that will require some time. That's why just keep practicing over and over and over again. Know your ideal outcome and trust you will get there. Perfect. Yeah, that's it. Putting, putting the scientist hat and the investigator hat on makes a lot of sense. And it's just helping them to step out of that cycle of going, Oh, I ate more than I should. I'm so rubbish. I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to win. But yeah. figuring out why, and yeah, that is so so useful. So, how um, so your summit is online? Can people also book and work with you online? Yes, absolutely. So I work uh, with people one-on-one -on -one as well. And again, they can go to my website, mindfulnessnz slash calendar okay. and then uh, book a free call with me so it's a complimentary call for I book one hour to one and a half hours for that person wow. to, <laughs> yes it's um, yeah I, I give a lot on that call because for me it's really important that we look into what are the issues what is not working for the person what are, what do they desire for themselves what is it that they're looking for but also what might be the roadblocks that are holding them back or keeping them stuck where they are and then based on that we can then go into more detail what i believe is happening uh what is the plan to, to move forward and in what way and in what capacity I uh, will be able to support them. And also if it feels right for both of us, because it's, uh, it's a long relationship that we develop and it needs to feel good. It needs to feel right for both parties. So both the within decide, do we want to go ahead together or not? And if not, I know you still got a lot of value out of this call because usually people say, Oh my God, like I'm, I've made me think about so much. Yeah. So yeah. That's great. That that's my, that's, that's what I want. And if we don't go ahead, if you find someone else, that's great. It's a, yeah, we can't work with everyone. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there's 4 million people in New Zealand alone. That's, that's right. A lot of people for one person. <laughs> that's right. But you also have, um, I know I'm a member of it myself, your um, Mindfulness Facebook group, which you go live in quite often. That's, that's a really valuable group for little tips and information in there. What is, what is the full name of that group? For, uh, food Freedom 
finding food freedom. That was it. Yeah. Mindfulness community. Yes. So I um, go once a lo- once a week there uh, on a weekly basis for twenty minutes, and I call them bite sized lunch breaks where I give <laughs> practical tools and tips people can apply to re- and from the comfort of their home to reprogram their brain to um yeah reshape their relationship with food fantastic and as I said I'll be sharing everything in the show Thanks. notes as well so people can find links to these so we're coming to the end looking at the time um is there anything that I may have missed that you'd like to cover a bit more? No, I think we talked about the triggers. We talked about, um, yeah, some of the tips. I, maybe when, uh, because you said, well, sometimes it's like the question is, uh, where do I start? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you tell that if someone was listening to these triggers and thought, oh my God, this is like all me, all the triggers, I've got it all. Um, then the question is, where do I start? I suggest to pick just one trigger, just mm-hmm. one. And a lot of the time it will probably be either emotional or restrictions. Yeah. So if let's say it is dieting or you're restricting food, you're trying to lose weight and then you just end up binge eating. My suggestion is to um, eat enough calories and also if someone is trying to lose weight and if this is what they want to do, it's their choice. Uh, just make sure that you still have a lot of variety of different foods. Um, even if you are in calorie deficit, and if, if you choose to do that, you know, it's your choice. We're adults, we can do what we want. But within that, if we can integrate all food groups, not cutting out any food groups, um, unless obviously for um, if we're allergic or, or can't tolerate food, that's a different story. Yeah. But have a variety of food, even like a piece of chocolate. There is there are there is enough chocolate, like different chocolate, uh, which doesn't have that many calories. You still have a little piece of chocolate every day. So just go for it, or make your own at home. Right? We can make it with cacao and mm. coconut, and then um, really enjoy it. So I think it's really really important to keep all sorts of food groups in our diet um that helps with binge eating definitely as well perfect and that's probably covered my next my final question which is if you could summarize what we've talked about today into one thing that you'd like the women listening to this podcast to take away what would that be <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'd like to summarize, but probably yes, I will summarize the last point that I made. Um, oh, the door is opening. <laughs> um, probably pick one, one or two maximum of the triggers. Uh, go through, so download this workbook, it's free workbook pick one or two and just focus on those. So one or the two triggers, focus on those and identify where are you right now? Where do you want to be? What are the two or three things that I suggest in the workbook that you can do? Let's say if restriction is one of them, then introduce all food groups into your diet and keep repeating it over and over and over again until You've got that until you've got it covered, until you know, okay, I feel better about this trigger, then move on to the next. It might take a while, but hey, what is half a year, right? I'm just throwing a number. What is half a year in a whole lifetime? Because we still live quite long these days. So we we might still have another 60, 50 years ahead of us. (laughs) So it's worthwhile to put that effort in now to have then life that's easy right because life is actually in in general too short worrying about food yes perfect that was a good summary (laughs) thank you so much i'll let you and your little ghost head off and enjoy the rest of your day that was a bit scary with the door um 
So yes, I will share all the links to your seminar website and your socials in the show notes. And this will go live in the next couple of weeks. So I will let you know. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. It's really a huge pleasure and it was fun. Thank you.